Thank you, Tom, for a really, really good story. Good evening, everyone. Hey. Thank you for coming out tonight to hear me tell my story of the struggle that I've had in speaking about my dear, close friend, Ed Leone, that guy, who also is a bit of, well, no, he's not a bit. He could be an incredible pain, a pain in the butt. And he's also a guy that I killed last April. I'm struggling trying to find something to say about Ed, how to, how to put my thoughts together and what he meant to me in the time that I knew him. It was, it was strange. I do a lot of public speaking. I have a business where I coach people and how to, how to speak in public and make presentations just like this. But there's something about Ed and speaking about him and my relationship with him that I have just not been able to do it. Last Sunday, I was finally able to write something down. Tuesday, I looked at it with oh, yeah, and threw it out. I couldn't figure out what was the problem. Why was I struggling? I asked some friends and it finally came to me. It just it dawned on me what my problem was. Can anybody out there in the audience have any ideas of what it might have been? Right, too, too soon. Thank you. It was too soon. That's exactly it. It's almost like I, I actually did say that line to me, right? <laughs> There's a time and a place for everything. And with Ed, he was a guy who had everything going for him in his life. He was a multi-faceted multi athlete in high school. He could, he could build anything. He made anything with his hands. He could, in high school, he would just be the man about town. He had a very successful remodeling business. He had a body that would just put Adonis to shame. Not mine, not mine. And he, he had, uh, there's pictures I've seen of him in a bar where the women are draped all over him, and he just had everything going for him. The problem is that he kind of believed his own hype. He was the kind of guy that with his personality, he could just draw everybody in the room to him. And I guess he just spent a little bit too many nights in the bars after work, and he became an alcoholic, and then that led to cocaine. And you know, we all know the story. A little bit turns into a lot, and then from there, everything you, in your life revolves around getting that next fix. So he just would just, he burned so many bridges in his family's life just trying to get that next fix. He turned, he borrowed money from people, never paid them back, and it just, he just turned everything off in his life. And fortunately, I say fortunately, I met him on the way when he was spiraling down to the bottom in, in his life, where he, he had lost everything in his life. He had lost his family, his house, his daughter who he lived with him, that he, he just adored him. He abused her and just pushed her away. And after he died, I, I called her up. And I asked her if she had a preference for which cemetery to put him in. And she said, nope, whatever you want, I don't care, and don't even tell me where he is. Mm -hmm. His nephew worked at St. Luke's Hospital, and with Ed dying of the hospital above him, the nephew said, thank you very much for calling me and letting me know. I don't care, please don't call me again. I mean, that thing, talk about burning every single bridge in your life. You know, they, so I met him in 2005. I had a painting contracting business, and a lot of my customers were asking me for, for carpentry, and it was more, more carpentry skill set than I had at the time. So the phone rang one day, and it's Ed. And he was asking if I needed any help with carpentry, and he was very upfront. At that point, he had stopped cocaine, but he was still an alcoholic. And he told me, he said, I have heart issues, I have circulation problems, I have leg problems, 
but I can still give you four to six hours of good work a day. And he said, okay. Seemed to me it turned out to be a, a deal made in purgatory. <laughs> because he, he taught me everything I know about carpentry. And we also, it was funny, our personalities, we fought like, like cats and dogs, like old men together. And everything was fine as long as you recognized that Ed was the font of all knowledge about everything in the world. <laughs> then everything, it was, it was peaceful after that. <laughs> in 2008, Ed could no longer do any work. So he moved to New Bedford to the most drug infested part of New Bedford, over behind Market Basket. And in the 10 years that he lived there, he had four, yeah, four drug dealers either killed, you know, shot, or stabbed to death in his apartment building or outside in the street or outside his apartment building. His apartment building was one of those ones where the windows were broken, the linoleum was all curling up, there was grime everywhere, there was holes in the ceiling that the water was dripping through. But at that point in his life, Ed really found peace and redemption. As his circumstances really, that was, you know, when you look at him, you say, my God, that guy is a, has hit the bottom of his life. But he didn't see it that way. What I admired about Ed was that he always held his reality that it was his responsibility He's the one who put himself in that situation, and he is the only one who put him out. He never blamed anybody else for any of his problems. He took responsibility for everything. And in that respect, he had a lot of integrity in his life. He had, he befriended these two drug addicted uh, sex workers who were, were in the neighborhood. And he trusted them enough with money, he gave these women money, and they would go to the store and get him groceries and smokes because at that point he couldn't walk very well and he didn't have a car. And in return, they got a father figure that they could talk to and a couch that they could crash on as long as he didn't bring any drugs into his apartment. He also was determined, absolutely determined, to get rid of the drug dealers in his apartment in the little neighborhood outside his house. So he got a hold of the, the cell phone numbers for a couple of the New Bedford narcotics detectives. And he worked out a, a text and a, and, a, and a voice code so he could call them up or text them and let them know when the drug dealers were getting in a supply of drugs. Hmm. He had to do it you know, sporadically because if the drug dealers found out what he was doing, that it was him, you know, they would have killed him. But it took four years but he was able to finally get his apartment building, drug dealer free, as well as regiment in the neighborhood outside of his place, he was free. And the cops you know, thanked him and rewarded him with uh, a whole pile of lottery tickets. <laughs> he won a couple hundred bucks, but it never, never amounted to a whole, a whole lot. What I really appreciated about Ed was that I could talk to him about anything. And he was never, he never judged me. I could talk to him about my problems and he was very insightful and he could see right to the heart of the matter and talk to me about what was going on. And because he couldn't go anywhere, I could call him at any time of day or night and he'd be there. And he also couldn't sleep, so he, I, I could call him at one in the morning and he'd be there. The other thing that I liked about Ed is that he, I would take him out for rides, because you know, again, he was has in those four walls in his apartment. I would take him out for rides and for meals, and just to get him outside, and just be able to see the water, be able to see, see, the, see the trees and see the leaves. And it really made a huge impression on him to be able to see these things. And the thing that also he had that an abundance was just an appreciation and, and the irony, he, he always saw the irony about how life can look one way one day and then completely turn around the next. And it's all how your viewpoint sees things. So 
So I would look at his where he lived over in the Bedford, and I would just be like, oh, how can you live in such a dump with all these people getting killed? And it just was, it was depressing. But he didn't see it that way. He looked at it that he had a mission to be able to rehabilitate some of the people over there and in that process to redeem himself at the same time. Mm. And I always used to tease him that he had everything wrong with him except cancer. <laughs> and then in October of 2018, he was diagnosed with both rectal and pancreatic cancer. I was very sad for him, and then also as his healthcare proxy, I was knew that my life was going to be a lot more and deeply involved and enmeshed in his life going forward. This past April, I was down in D.C., and my daughter lives down there, and she had a new boyfriend, and I went down to meet him and take her, her boyfriend, and some of their friends out for dinner. And we were having a great time. The music, the wine, everything was flowing, the conversation was great, we were laughing. And then my phone rang. And I looked at it, and I recognized it was a New Bedford exchange. So I went outside and answered it. And it was an ER doctor from, from St. Luke's. So I'm standing outside, looking in the glass window. And my daughter and her friends, I could see them. And they're happy, and they're laughing, and having a great time. And this doctor is telling me that Ed had had a massive heart attack that day. And in the ambulance ride back to the hospital, to the hospital, they were able to restart his heart, but that he had very little brain activity and he would be in a vegetative state for the rest of his life. He was asking me, what do you want to do? I'm looking in the window at all of this life and this energy and talking to this doctor about what to do with my friend who was up in this hospital bed in, in the bedroom. Ed was very clear to me about what he wanted his wishes were it to be if he was ever in this situation. So with a very heavy heart, I said to the doctor, you know, pull the plug. <laughs> so at that moment, you know, Ed, as my dear friend, I ended up, he ended up dying twice that day. But I will never forget the impact he had and the way he just put himself into my life. And I am much better off for it. Thank you very much.